Hi, and welcome to the show. Subscribe at kevinemdy.com slash podcast. Get CME for this episode by clicking on the CME link in the show notes. Today, we welcome back Katrina Gibson. She's an emergency physician for Kevin MD articles titled, The Struggle to Fill Emergency Medicine Residency Spots, Exploring the Factors Behind the Unfilled Match. Katrina, welcome back to the show. Thank you once again for having me. Uh, I'm sorry that it's under these conditions as this article needed to be written in the first place. So we'll talk about that article in a little bit, but for those who didn't listen to our first episode together, just briefly share your story and journey to where you are today. Sure. I am currently an assistant professor of emergency medicine at Emory in Atlanta, Georgia. I practice clinically at Grady, which for those of you who do not know, is the fourth busiest emergency department in in the entire country. I came here from Washington, D.C., where I completed a health policy fellowship at George Washington University, but I was born and raised in Ann Arbor, Michigan, so the Midwest is still and will always be home. And I've been all over the country for my education and training, like a lot of people in our field. I went to Yale for undergrad, studied biomedical engineering, and did some work at the University of uh, Pennsylvania before ending back in the Midwest in Cleveland, Ohio for medical school, which is at Case Western Reserve University. I had the pleasure of staying for my emergency medicine training before heading to DC. And I have now been in Atlanta for almost five years now. And while this has been a, a whirlwind of a journey, I think my, my true north throughout this entire training process has been health equity. And uh, I truly believe that it is a form of social justice this social justice is health equity and the reverse is uh, true as well. My research focuses on vulnerable populations, will that be whether that be elderly patients versus the under or uninsured or racial or religious minorities and how they access and utilize the emergency department. So using that as my focus has just really allowed me to kind of define and, and adjust the lens through which I practice medicine and how I choose other topics of interest as well. The news that led you to write this article, of course, was the unfilled emergency medicine slots in the most recent match. You talk about some of those reasons in your Kevin MD article, the struggle to fill emergency medicine residency spots, exploring the factors behind the unfilled match. Now, before you talk about the article, talk about mm -hmm. some context, talk about those most recent match results. Sure. So I'm sure that most of your listeners are familiar with the match process. After four years of college, four years of medical school, the journey to become a physician is still not done. You need to match into a specialty of your choosing. Historically, emergency medicine has been extremely competitive, and it wasn't until 2022 that the specialty started to see a decline in unmatched positions. For instance, in 2022, 219 unmatched positions were was considered unprecedented. This was the first major decrease in those spots in quite some time. However, recently the Annals of Emergency Medicine, they have predicted a surplus of emergency docs in 2030. Residents, medical students, even other, you know, already seasoned physicians and attendings were paying attention. So a lot of students are not going to want to pursue a specialty in which they feel like they they cannot get a job. But in 2023, there were about 3,282 medical students, which is actually down from 4,391 medical students who were applying for just over 3,000 positions in emergency medicine. So of course, there's always a surplus of students for a certain number of spots. However, this is the largest number of unmatched positions that we've seen. We thought that 219 was surprising in 2022. Just recently in March of this year, we have more than doubled that number of unmatched positions in the field of emergency medicine. So of course, those of us in academia, what the community, we're all scrambling to figure out why this may be. And of course, some of those explanations are more tangible, objective, and obvious than others. First, let's talk about boarding. This practice of admitted hospital patients physically staying in the emergency department. We ask ourselves, well, what does that really mean from an emergency medicine standpoint for as far as physicians and staffing goes? It leads to worse outcomes for our patients. Mm -hmm. For instance, 
If you have sick patients that require ICU step down or telemetry settings, to try to take care of those patients in a busy hallway is difficult. It's difficult for our nurses, physicians, support staff, and it can be dangerous for patients. Our nurses are overwhelmed. We've heard about how there's been a nursing shortage. Nurses are burned out. It's easier to make mistakes when you are taking care of more patients, particularly when those patients have more complex medical needs than what the emergency department can often offer those patients. Further exacerbated by these wait times being anywhere from six to seven hours, or sometimes upwards of two to three days for admitted patients in the emergency department. So of course, boarding has made it difficult for people to practice emergency medicine and medical students for paying attention. I think that this is one of the contributing factors, one of many that led so many physicians to remain unfilled. Another thing is compensation. Of course, none of us are going into emergency medicine or medicine for that matter, to get rich, okay? Sure, we have to live, we have bills to pay, but there's a certain amount of altruism that goes into pursuing a career in emergency medicine. But one of the things that I think that people are paying attention more to now, particularly as the Biden administration is discussing loan forgiveness, public service loan forgiveness has always been questionable. The National Health Service Corps, they provide debt forgiveness for primary care specialties. So what is primary care? That's internal medicine, OB-GYN, pediatrics. However, as an emergency medicine physician, anywhere from 13 to 27% of my ED visits are appropriate for primary care settings. So what does that mean? I know a lot of us, you know, we watch television, some of one of our favorite shows or ED, we're thinking, you're thinking that you're always running, you know, trauma, traumatic arrests or putting in, you know, chest tubes and intubating. And of course, that is a lot of what it is that we do, particularly if you're in a level one, two or three trauma center. But also a lot of what we do includes filling somebody's antihypertensives because not only did they run out of medication, but perhaps they have a primary care doctor. But do you really have access to a primary care physician if it takes three, four, five, or even six months in some cases to actually access those physicians? So A lot of our patients come to us not because they are having a life or limb threatening medical condition, but simply because, you know, they need their medication refilled and they don't have any other options. And, you know, it's our it's our duty to take care of those patients, to offer them those preventive services so that they don't have a medical emergency down the line. So where am I going with this? If if emergency medicine physicians, if a third of the care that we're providing is considered appropriate for a, a primary care visit, then we should be also eligible for these loan forgiveness opportunities for primary care providers. Another thing is what about, you know, hazard pay? Working in the emergency department, even outside of a pandemic, is dangerous. However, let us not forget that at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of our hospitals didn't even have basic personal protective equipment. I'm talking, we were being told how to reuse our N95 masks. Sometimes we didn't have gowns. We didn't have, you know, adequate gloves. And this was in a setting before we even had the COVID vaccine or other, you know, antibodies to to treat this relatively, you know, new novel disease that was life-threatening for a lot of people. And of course, certain populations, Black and brown people, or for those who are lower social economic status, who were disproportionately affected by COVID due to a mere number of reasons. You know, they weren't able to to work from home. They didn't have access to health care or who were underinsured or uninsured. And this all put a burden on the health care system as well. So, you know, I know it's 2023 20, now, and we're not looking at COVID-19 as the same pandemic or emergency that it was in the last couple of years. However, we're still seeing the effects and follow-up of this disease. Over 1.1 million Americans lost their lives. And this isn't even, of course, including the, the worldwide loss of lives as well as productivity. And this affected how we practice medicine. For, as far as medical students, This also took a toll on their clinical opportunities. There was a time period where medical students were pulled from their rotations. They weren't allowed to practice in the emergency department during the height of COVID due to safety reasons. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's completely appropriate. However, it also decreased their exposure 
to the, to the specialty. And once we started to integrate these medical students back into our specialty, trust and believe they weren't paying attention. They looked around and they saw, you know, us at our, our emergency departments at 130 to 150 percent capacity. They saw, you know, sick patients mm. being taken care of in the hallway. They saw us reusing our masks, and they saw the burnout that comes comes from working in such a high stress environment. And the learners now are thinking just as important as their compensation as their quality of life. And I think that with the burnout being such an issue for uh, physicians in general, emergency medicine physicians reported some of the highest levels of burnout. And these are all contributing factors that things that we're talking about, things that medical students see, things that residents are seeing, and it's really changing not only where they want to practice and what they want to practice. Now, you have some unique insight from the academic perspective of emergency medicine. When you first read about these statistics about unfilled slots, what was the first thing that went through your mind? Were you surprised? Did you see it coming? You know, I think that nothing really surprises me anymore, and which is, which is uh, concerning, but I did see this coming. From a personal standpoint, these last several years professionally have been extremely difficult. And I think that these circumstances are giving us the opportunity to really not only acknowledge our professional difficulties, but our, our personal difficulties. We're starting to, when I say we, I mean not only just a specialty of emergency medicine, but medicine in general. We're starting to talk about you know, burnout, fatigue, and wellness. These are things that, you know, we were thought that, you know, we we're just supposed to suffer in, in silence and keep your head down and keep it pushing or else you were weak, you're not a good doctor, or maybe this isn't the specialty or field for you. And now that I'm seeing that the ways that all of us are affected both personally and professionally, it only makes sense that people don't want to work in environments where they feel like there isn't the infrastructure for them to be not only excellent physicians, but whole and well people as well. Because you can't have one without the other. Of course, you know, certain shifts are going to be more stressful than, than others, but it would be helpful knowing that if you come into the emergency department and you are going to be able to have to take care of a number of sick people, you'd like to know that you have adequate nursing staff that have the resources and the morale to take care of those patients. You want to know that you have the equipment in place to be safe and protect yourself so that when you go home to your family or friends that you're not a risk for them as well for bringing home whatever communicable diseases that you may have. Or you'd also like to think that um, after all these years of education, that you're going to be able to pay off your loans, which in many cases is six figures plus. Medical students are graduating with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt. And as, as we've discussed before, certain populations, namely Black and Brown students, due to social drivers of health, often share a disproportionate amount of that debt. Mm. So these are all things that people are taking into consideration when they choose a specialty and compensation, wellness, happiness, and family work-life balance are things that we're starting to talk about. And it, we shouldn't be surprised when medical students are starting to listen and, and choose their specialty accordingly. So talking among the physician community, I know the ramifications of this, but from a patient perspective, why are these unfilled slots? Why, why is this important to patients? Sure. So the if you're in the emergency department, the vast majority of the time, you, you're not having the best day of your life. It can be a disorienting place for our patients. It can be a scary place for our patients. And unfortunately, depending upon the circumstances, it can be a dangerous place. But for patients, the concern is, am I going to be taken care of to the best of the system's ability? So what does that mean? It is the nurse that's taking care of me. Are they going to have four patients or are they going to have six to seven patients, one of which might be on a, a drip that needs to be titrated to maintain their blood pressure? So patients are waiting longer, maybe for medication. Maybe they're not having the face time with their nurses and physicians, not because we don't care and that we're not dedicated to their needs, but because there are limitations on one's physical bandwidth as well as our, our mental bandwidth. And that just puts stressors on, on individuals, which then of course creates stressors and infrastructure that 
already exist. So, so patients are waiting longer to be seen. Sometimes they're being denied care and they're leaving the emergency department due to long wait times. Whereas that chest pain that they're thinking could maybe have just been indigestion could actually have been some sort of heart attack or, or coronary syndrome. And when people are tired and burnt out, that also affects our empathy, our sympathy, how we interact with patients. And this can have different ramifications for certain populations. You know, everything I talk about is always going to go back to the social drivers of health. When people are tired and under and under stress, maybe they're going to be less cognizant of their implicit biases when they interact with a patient that, that doesn't look like them. And that can really set the tone for not only that emergency department visit, but for how that patient or their family views the system that may not already take the best care of patients that look like them, whether it be because of their race, ethnicity, able-bodiedness, or gender identification. So what's being done among the emergency physician professional societies to turn this around? Yes. So excellent question. It's easy to get caught up in talking about the, the problems and feeling overwhelmed by them because a lot of them are, are systemic as opposed to just kind of individual or local institutional types of problems. So what does this mean for us as academic programs? I think one of the things that's important is reassuring our, our residents that they can find work and, be, and after they've invested all of this time and effort into gaining this expertise and training. So some of the things that we're doing is just really investing in their, their wellness, their education, knowing what to do when they do feel burned out and or overwhelmed so they're not feeling that they have to, to vacate the specialty, be more proactive in the recruitment process, not only from the medical student to residency pipeline, but making sure that we have established working relationships with other institutions so that after they graduate, they, they will find work. I think it's important that you know we, as, as, as medical experts, Experts that we use our voices on the Hill. Policy for me is not only a capital P, but little p as well. And when I say that, like what types of institutional policies as well as regional and national policies are in place that take into consideration what's best not only for our patients, but also for our, our nurses, our PPs and physicians as well to practice medicine. So empowering Patients is just as important as empowering physicians and using our, our academic societies as a voice to make sure that we have the resources that we need, that our patients are not only insured, but appropriately assured, that there's mental health parity for our patients. I think all of these type of preventive measures and resources can really change how our patients are using the emergency department. So, I mean, people are always going to be sick. People are always going to have accidents, but that upwards of 30% of, of medical problems and care that can be taken care of and are addressed in an outpatient setting, however, they're ending up in the emergency department. We need to take a few steps back and figure out why. We always you know, know that an ounce of, of prevention definitely exceeds treatment. So I think that making sure that our patients have resources is in the form of insurance, access to healthy foods, access to you know safe areas to exercise, all of the things that kind of acts that exacerbate chronic disease that causes our patients to end up in the emergency department, particularly for those that are underinsured and uninsured, really decrease the, the load for emergency medicine physicians and departments so that we can truly focus on acute exacerbations of chronic illness or true medical emergencies or urgencies so that that just puts a lot of relief on the system. It keeps our patients healthier longer and that focus on, on prevention and the policies that make sure that they have access to maintenance of care is, I think, is extremely effective in addressing the, the number of patients that we see in the emergency department and why. I want to ask you about the impact of private equity. As you know, the trend is that a lot of these private equity groups are purchasing emergency department groups. And when that happens, cost cutting becomes paramount. Does that play a role in the appeal of the field going forward? 
I think it certainly does. I mean, as long as, you know, profit is, is valued over outcomes, that's why we'll, we'll continue to see certain trends, particularly, you know, in, in boarding as opposed to, for instance, as opposed to maybe hiring more nurses and support staff or, or giving them raises or paying them appropriately for the work that they do. If that's not happening, then you're going to see fewer physicians, fewer nurses and support staff that, that are available to take care of more and more patients. For instance, here in Atlanta, one of the more devastating things that could have occurred to us in the last several years is the closing of Atlanta Medical Center, one of our other trauma hospitals in the center in the area. And we're seeing the effects of that. Our volumes, particularly our trauma volumes, are increased and there needs to be some sort of accountability. Of course, our healthcare system differs in that, you know, it's, it, is, it is run as a business and as a for-profit business, which doesn't make sense. It kind of makes it difficult, almost impossible to, to, to prioritize health outcomes and or equity in a business model, because a lot of those same capitalistic views or goals that we may apply to, to other fields doesn't translate when it comes to, when it comes to the preservation of human health and human life. Now, to a certain extent, those models look very different when you're talking about maybe academia versus a community setting in a teaching hospital. But nonetheless, all institutions have a bottom line. And that when that bottom line is profit, then health equity and health care can and will suffer. And my final question, Katrina, tell us some of your take-home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience. Sure. So I think that these types of incidences are reminders that we need to be a voice for our patients as well as for our specialty and for the field of medicine. All of these issues are multifactorial, they're multi-pronged, they're things that need to be done at the institutional level, the federal level, but a lot of the people, the legislators, the politicians who are making these types of decisions most of them have never stepped inside of a hospital or, or under the guise of being a patient, and they're just not familiar with and are aware of the types of issues that come with adequate patient care. So the only people who can speak for us is us. And I realize that not everybody's interested in health policy, and some of us want to just kind of go to work, do the best that we can for our patients and go home, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I think it's important that we acknowledge that that means that, you know, you need to be cognizant of who's running your hospital, who your state and local lawmakers are, and who is setting the policies for how we practice medicine, how we're compensated, you know, how our, what our match processes look like. And all, because all of these are contributing factors to how we're able to practice physicians and if we're able to maintain our wellness in doing so, and if we're able to deliver our patients the utmost equitable health care. Katrina, thanks again for coming back on the show and sharing your time and insight. Thank you so much for having me. Mm-hmm.